From laughable endings to gratuitous violence to one of Nick Cage's most iconic performances, the reasons are endless for why audiences gave these movies a failing grade. With the movie 10, Bo Derek exploded onto moviegoers' radar as both a sex symbol and an actor to watch. She even managed to score a Golden Globe nomination for her work in the film, which was only her second acting credit. There were high expectations for where Derek would go next as a performer, though she never quite got back to that level of exciting momentum. By 1984, she was already headlining box office duds like Bolero, which was so despised by moviegoers that it scored an F rating from audiences in the nascent years of CinemaScore's existence. What happened? There were countless reasons why Bolero was torn to shreds by the general public, though its runtime of 104 minutes could be a key culprit. Not that a movie that's less than two hours long should be considered extensive in any normal case, but Bolero's plotline, which concerns a woman seeking out the perfect person to take her virginity, is stretched far past the breaking point. Uh, you are like uh, the most precious flower. Your blooming can only be enjoyed once. It doesn't help that Bolero also has an incredibly stiff and straight-laced tone with no room for the kind of inadvertent comedy that makes something like The Room such a cult classic. <laughs> Moviegoers trapped in a theater watching Bolero were simply bored by what was on screen rather than unintentionally amused by it. In the end, the film ended up winning six Razzie Awards. Unsurprisingly, it was five more years before Bo Derek returned to the silver screen with another star vehicle after this debacle. As the 20th century was drawing to a close, the second film ever to score an F Cinema score grade finally arrived. The project that scored this dubious honor was the 1999 Stephen Elliott thriller Eye of the Beholder. Headlined by Ewan McGregor and Ashley Judd, the film saw McGregor portraying a spy who follows a serial killer across the United States. Of course, the twist is that he ends up forming an attachment to her. It's a story that employs several uses of inexplicable imagery and narrative turns, all in the hope of creating an atmosphere that would leave audiences unsure of where it was going next. In the process, Eye of the Beholder just created an atmosphere that audiences hated. The creepy behavior on the part of McGregor's protagonist, which Elliot often plays off as sweet or tender, undoubtedly put off viewers, as well as the strange cinematography that leaves Eye of the Beholder visually incomprehensible in some spots. Plus, all the ambiguity resulted in a slow feature that failed to deliver the thrills moviegoers were looking for. No wonder this Ewan McGregor vehicle became only the second 20th century movie to get the dreaded F. In his career, director Robert Altman was responsible for some of the most acclaimed movies of all time. Titles like Nashville and McCabe and Mrs. Miller have become indisputable classics since they debuted, while even more divisive projects like Popeye have major cult followings. A director this ambitious is bound to produce something that resonates with people even when he fails to deliver a new masterpiece. However, one of the more disposable entries in his vast filmography was his 2000 directorial effort Dr. T and the Women, which paired up Richard Gere with an all-star supporting cast of ladies ranging from Helen Hunt to Laura Dern, among many others. Women are, by nature, they are saints. They're sacred and they should be treated as such. None of those performances were able to win over general moviegoers who branded Dr. T and the Women with an F cinema score grade. Part of the issue was that this feature was marketed as a star-studded romantic comedy. It was actually a more tonally complicated movie that went down some truly absurd narrative avenues. The sign of Richard Gere driving into a tornado may have satisfied Altman on the set, but it resulted in a feature whose final 30 minutes left a sour taste in the mouths of baffled moviegoers. Plus, the peculiar tone of the movie, which struggled to balance lightness with darker concepts, divided critics and alienated the general public. Chalk this one up as a strangely sizable misfire for a legend like Robert Altman. As a cinematographer, Janusz Kaminski has a filmography that's tough to beat. A go-to collaborator with Steven Spielberg, starting with Schindler's List in 1993, Kaminsky has an avalanche of iconic movies under his belt, ranging from Jerry Maguire to The Diving Bell and The Butterfly, among many others. However, this talent didn't quite translate to his debut as a director in 2000 with the horror feature Lost Souls. Bestowed with an F grade by audiences, Kaminsky's work on Lost Souls is dreadfully bereft of memorable scenes, the kiss of death for any mainstream horror film. I'm going in with you. You wouldn't last five minutes. Moviegoers will tolerate a lot in the pursuit of frights, like contrived plot points or stilted acting, but a deficit of scares is impossible to overcome. Plus, Lost Souls delivers an ending that drops one big twist after another before concluding in a very abrupt manner. While a solid ending wouldn't have fixed every problem in Lost Souls, it certainly would have sent audiences out of the theater on a much more satisfied note. Unsurprisingly, after helming a film that got such toxic buzz, Kaminsky has largely stuck to cinematography in the decades since. Typically, even the lowest-rated comedies have redeeming qualities. Look at Bucky Larson, Born to be a Star. As critically savaged as it was, it still earned a B-Cinema score grade from audiences. 
However, not every comedy is impervious to this phenomenon, such as the 2000 John Travolta and Lisa Kudrow flop Lucky Numbers. Am I the only one who misses our old pal Jack Frost? Temperaturas, a eh, loco. <laughs> this feature was especially reviled by the public because it's a misguided stab at a dark comedy, a genre that can become insufferably mean-spirited if done poorly. Some critics were so confused by its tone that they couldn't even categorize it. Roger Ebert wrote at the time of its release, Is it intended as a comedy or not? I ask because there are funny things in it and then gruesome things, sad things, and brutal things. Quentin Tarantino was able to cover that spread in Pulp Fiction, but Nora Ephron doesn't find a way. The film's cinema score grade was also likely exacerbated by John Travolta being an especially ripe punching bag in 2000, thanks to the then-recent failure of Battlefield Earth. A perfect storm of actors swirled around lucky numbers to make it the rare comedy that's so bad it earned an F rating. Horror films can often be dismissed as junk food cinema, but that's giving the genre an incredibly insulting short shrift. Scary movies have the power to be vivid reflections of the anxieties of a specific era. They're just as capable of illuminating the inner psyche of general moviegoers as they are at being low-budget stabs at easy cash. Of course, not every horror feature that attempts to be relevant lives up to its potential. Take the 2002 title Fear.com, which aimed to be the nightmare on Elm Street for a generation of moviegoers raised on AOL dial-up. An ideal execution of this premise could have delivered a horror film that spoke profoundly to those living in the internet age. Unfortunately, Fear.com missed the mark on that front. One weird element about the film in hindsight is how much of its horror hinges on vicious torture sequences. Two years before Saw made that style of scares much more mainstream, Fear.com was too ahead of the curve in this regard, and the emphasis on such brutality just wasn't what audiences were hungry for yet. Plus, its final 30 minutes are packed with contrived twists that turn the whole film into a ludicrous farce, albeit an unfunny one. The 2002 feature Solaris was helmed by Steven Soderbergh and functioned as a new adaptation of the Stanislav Lem novel of the same name, which was previously turned into a motion picture by filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. Solaris has a certain pedigree that was only enhanced by the presence of George Clooney in the lead role. With such prominent names all connected to the feature, one would expect Solaris to at least be competent after all is said and done. Instead, Solaris was despised by viewers. What's wrong? Shortly after the film's release, Clooney opened up to the Seattle Times to divulge his frustrations over how Solaris was marketed. Specifically, he found that every ad or trailer for the sci-fi title felt totally disconnected from the final product. Misleading marketing campaigns often inspire anger from moviegoers, as people prefer to get exactly what they were promised on a poster when they sit down to watch a movie. Plus, the extremely glacial pacing of the project was always bound to be divisive, even if the marketing campaign had been perfect. Usually, the only projects that fare well after taking forever to be released are huge blockbusters that megafans enjoy stewing on for long periods of time, and we can all agree that Solaris does not fit into that category whatsoever. Unfortunately, the title of Darkness does not refer to its humorous use in a song sung by Lego Batman in the Lego movie. Instead, Darkness is a 2004 horror film that most of us either forgot or never knew existed. It's different here. The dark. What do you mean? It eats my pencils. The feature had spent years in limbo when it came to getting released outside of its home country, thanks to North American distributor Miramax engaging in severe editing to make it more marketable, a tragically common practice for many foreign titles acquired by Miramax. Darkness ended up losing around 14 minutes of footage when all the trimming was done. The behind-the-scenes turmoil is important to consider when grappling with just how reviled Darkness turned out to be by general audiences. Inevitably, the cut released to North American moviegoers was so jarringly edited and incoherent that it irritated audiences instead of terrifying them. It's also yet another horror movie that concludes on an open-ended note that suggests terrible things will eventually happen to our lead characters, but doesn't offer a concrete resolution. After sitting through so much impenetrable storytelling, audiences wanted something more satisfyingly definitive. This makes it unsurprising that Darkness was given an F grade by audiences, though it does provide an ironic finish to a feature whose post-production was plagued by studio interference to make it more audience-friendly. If one is talking about the most reviled movies of the 21st century, it's only a matter of time before director Uwe Boole enters the conversation. A staple of 2000s genre cinema, Boole's films were infamous for inexplicable casting choices, like Burt Reynolds showing up in the period piece fantasy film In the Name of the King, A Dungeon Siege Tale, an atrocious dialogue that inspires unintentional fits of giggles from viewers. Among his early notorious works was Alone in the Dark, a video game adaptation that dropped into theaters in January 2005. This motion picture proved to be dreadful. For some artsier movies, it's a very nuanced process breaking down the reasons a feature was so rejected by general moviegoers. In the case of Alone in the Dark, the explanation is fairly simple. It's just not very good. It begins with a lengthy opening text crawl that's read aloud to the viewer. 
These artifacts speak of terrifying creatures that thrive in the darkness, waiting for the day when the gate can be opened again. This unintentionally hilarious choice is followed up by a barrage of confounding editing and screenwriting that ranks up with Bull's worst entries in terms of baffling ineptitude. When people bought a ticket to Alone in the Dark, they just wanted to watch some sci-fi horror carnage for a few hours. What they got instead was an unintentional comedy that fans have been dunking on for almost 20 years now. To say that Wolf Creek is a harrowing movie is a bit of an understatement. It never lets up with its unflinching depictions of unspeakable violence, nearly all of it targeted against women. This approach divided critics, who were torn between thinking the craftsmanship on display justified the onslaught of misery and feeling as though it was all just torment with no underlying point. Audiences were significantly more unanimous in their opinion on Wolf Creek, awarding the movie an F cinema score grade. Uh -oh. Though some filmmakers may have been discouraged to see audiences so thoroughly reject their work, Wolf Creek director Greg McLean held the movie's F cinema score grade up as a badge of honor. McLean explained to ComicBook.com in 2017 that the primary factor behind Wolf Creek getting an F rating was that it was so different from traditional horror fare. To see moviegoers so viscerally respond to what was happening on screen that they could only respond with an F made McLean quite proud. Plus, McLean considers cinema score grades more of a reflection of whether or not moviegoers got their previewing expectations met rather than a microcosm of a motion picture's actual quality and merit. Since its release, the 2006 Nicolas Cage horror film The Wicker Man has inspired plenty of joy thanks to rampant internet memes based on its most ludicrous moments. Oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! In these small, out-of-context bursts of absurdist internet material, The Wicker Man is a comedic triumph. As a feature-length piece of horror cinema, though, The Wicker Man didn't please anybody. On its opening weekend, moviegoers dubbed The Wicker Man worthy of the lowest cinema score grade. It wasn't just a handful of unintentionally hilarious moments, like Cage running up to punch somebody while in a bear outfit, a guaranteed Wicker Man such a disastrous audience rating. This horror film also ended on a dark note, suggesting that every horrific thing that befell Cage's protagonist would inevitably happen again and again, with no end in sight. Without any concrete resolution, audiences felt cheated by what they just witnessed. It didn't help that the original Wicker Man movie is a masterpiece of folk horror, and the reputation of that earlier feature undoubtedly further highlighted the already apparent flaws in this remake. However, The Wicker Man can at least take mild comfort in knowing it inspired a swarm of well-liked memes, and will undoubtedly be included in Cage's extensive list of iconic performances. 2007's Bug concerns a small group of people gripped by paranoia that escalates into violent delusions, with neither one truly tethered to reality. There are no easy answers as to what is real and what isn't, just constant uncertainty transporting viewers into these paranoid mindsets. This is a movie meant to challenge moviegoers rather than hand them easy answers on a plate. Naturally, this didn't go over well with the general public, especially with previewing expectations that Bug would be a normal horror film that offered easily digestible scares. Are they bad? <laughs> Upon its release to theaters, Bug was hated by audiences. Even critics, accustomed to such artsy forays into works that Ben genre norms, gave Bug mixed marks. Plus, the film opened in May 2007, directly against more traditional summertime fare like Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. The hottest months of the year are usually home to movies that deliver plenty of surface-level spectacle, and Bug stuck out like a sore thumb in this release window. With the final moments leaving viewers intentionally puzzled over what was real in the preceding film and what was fiction, it's easy to see how audiences were overall miffed by what they sat through. Movies never remain just movies. Once they're put out into the world, they inevitably take on larger significance beyond what the artists behind these works could have ever imagined. So it was with the 2007 erotic thriller I Know Who Killed Me. This dark feature saw Lindsay Lohan playing a woman struggling with her identity in the wake of being abducted and tortured. Who are you? Who is Aubrey? On paper, it wasn't a bad idea for a film that could solidify Lohan's gifts as an actor distinct from her child star career. In execution, though, things went haywire. Before the movie even came out, it was already at the center of tabloid reports obsessed with every move Lohan was making. With Lohan's mid-production rehab stint dominating the pre-release headlines, I Know Who Killed Me needed to be a masterpiece to evade all the toxic buzz. Unfortunately, for everyone involved in this movie, it was far from that. Initial critical reviews were disastrous, and audiences bestowed I Know Who Killed Me with an F cinema score grade. It's impossible to tell if all the Lohan-centric publicity hurt the film's audience reception, but it couldn't have helped. If there's one silver lining, though, it's that the movie has garnered a notable cult following in recent years. 
In hindsight, it's baffling that something like Disaster Movie was put into theaters, let alone given a massive wide release. While other parody movies from directors Aaron Seltzer and Jason Friedberg at least started with the idea of spoofing a specific movie or genre, Disaster Movie just skewered a slew of summer 2008 titles that hadn't even come out yet. It was a barrage of acknowledgments of other pop culture properties instead of any actual comedy, a nadir for parodic filmmaking and cinema as a whole. This feature landed a dreaded F cinema score grade, a demonstration that critics and audiences were in lockstep on the quality of the comedic disaster. Previous Seltzer and Friedberg films weren't beloved by audiences, but even Meet the Spartans was able to get a C-. Disaster Movie fared even worse for a multitude of reasons, including the use of incredibly creepy costumes for dark versions of characters like Poe the Panda and its style of raunchy humor trying awkwardly to fit into a PG-13 rating. Ultimately, it's just a movie that really didn't need to be made. In the 2009 Richard Kelly movie The Box, a married couple are faced with an enormous choice. They can press a button inside a box and get tons of money, but somebody in the world that they don't know will die. It's a moral quandary that sends the lead characters down a rabbit hole of conspiracy so convoluted that it's no surprise the film hails from the same mind behind Donnie Darko. Despite this connection, audiences had absolutely no problem assigning a stinging F grade to the box. The movie falls neatly into the camp of many motion pictures that receive the same grade. It's a genre exercise that offers lots of inexplicable events to the viewer, but no explanations for what's going on. By the end of the box, this fictional universe has expanded to include the very fabric of space and time itself, not to mention some infamous water tombs. It's all just the sort of intentionally baffling material that one would expect from Richard Kelly, but it's also guaranteed to leave audiences frustrated rather than satisfied. One of the most infamous movie endings of all time can be found in the final seconds of The Devil Inside, which abruptly cuts away from the immediate aftermath of the main characters being in a car accident to a wall of text informing moviegoers that if they want more information on this real case, they should go to a website link. Any potential dramatic resolution to the story audiences have been invested in for the last 80 minutes is thrown out the window. It's an incredibly underwhelming conclusion and a downright insult to the integrity of storytelling. Needless to say, such an abrupt wrap-up did not go over well with moviegoers. While other aspects of The Devil Inside inspired criticism, this conclusion proved especially divisive, and it being the last thing audiences saw before exiting the theater undoubtedly impacted this movie's cinema score grade. The film's dreadful word of mouth helped ensure its rapid descent from the top of the box office. Fittingly, this open-ended approach to concluding a mainstream horror movie has not been replicated in the years since The Devil Inside frustrated audiences across the globe. Before she took on the role of Wanda Maximoff in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, one of Elizabeth Olsen's very first leading roles came in the micro-budget horror movie Silent House. To make sure this feature stood out from the crowded pack of scary films out there, Silent House had the special flourish of occurring in real time. Its story was captured in a simulated single take, a gimmick it embraced long before Birdman in 1917 strolled into town and became Oscar darlings. Such technical details weren't enough to win over audiences, though, who loudly proclaimed Silent House was worthy of an F cinema score grade. The interesting wrinkle here is that Silent House was not universally trashed by critics like most other mainstream horror titles that get Fs. It received mixed reviews, but was far from having no defenders. Unfortunately, while its ambitious technical aspects were enough to save Silent House from total critical dismissal, its bleak tone and a barrage of strange narrative turns in the second half undoubtedly alienated the average moviegoer. Plus, the faux single-take filming gimmick was likely puzzling and off-putting to many, since a film without cuts or alternating perspectives can be a little too immersive if you're not ready for it. Killing Them Softly is a prime example of a movie that should have leaned into a theatrical run emphasizing arthouse theaters and audiences. With those moviegoers, the film could have had a chance to build up a better reputation. Director Andrew Dominic's bleak crime drama, which also functions as an equally morose reflection on the optimism of the Obama era, is not an easy film to watch, nor is it meant to leave you feeling enthralled. It's a grimy motion picture that offers up a mirror to our country and audiences themselves, right down to its unforgettable final line of dialogue. America's not a country. It's just a business. Now f pay me. Naturally then, the Weinstein Company decided that because Killing Them Softly was anchored by movie star Brad Pitt, it should be dropped into over 2,400 theaters right in the middle of the holiday season. Inevitably, a film with this release strategy marketed as just a general crime drama was despised by audiences. They wanted something traditional, not subversive and angry. Killing Them Softly so missed the mark in fulfilling audience expectations that it received an F grade from moviegoers and almost immediately vanished from movie theaters after its opening weekend. After 2012, the F Cinema score grade remained silent for five years. No new wide release received such vicious responses from the general public, and studios didn't have to deal with an abnormal audience score tanking a movie's reputation online. 
In September 2017, though, that hiatus came to a very vivid close with the premiere of Mother. This was the newest release from filmmaker Darren Aronofsky, whose preceding two directorial efforts, Black Swan and Noah, each cracked the $100 million mark domestically. Such a financial fate was not in the cards for Mother, especially after it received an infamous F mark from audiences on its opening weekend. Get out! Get out! Oh, it's interesting that Mother was the next movie to get the F cinema score grade after killing them softly, since both films are a bit similar. Each is headlined by a big movie star. In the case of Mother, the iconic lead is Jennifer Lawrence, and each was marketed as a bold new entry in a very accessible genre. However, Mother is not a standard horror film. It's a relentlessly dark movie drenched in religious symbolism that culminates in a baby getting ripped apart on screen and Lawrence getting physically abused. While Aronofsky's biblical allegory is doubtlessly original, it still ended up being a little too abstract and shocking for mainstream audiences. I gave you everything! You gave it all away. After a career of turning and stellar performances in a variety of movies across differing genres, Andrea Riseborough scored her first Oscar nomination at the 95th Academy Awards ceremony for her lead role in To Leslie. However, in a career as long as hers, it's inevitable that she would end up in one or two creative misfires. One of her most notable artistic missteps came just two years before the premiere of To Leslie with the 2020 horror remake The Grudge, which Riseborough herself headlined. She wasn't the only notable name in the cast of this new take on the Grudge universe, as the likes of Demian Bashir, John Cho, Jackie Weaver, and more were all scattered throughout the film's inexplicably stacked supporting cast. Unfortunately, none of these impressive performers was enough to win over any favor from audiences. Several elements of the feature, like its clumsily organized non-linear narrative structure, likely put audiences in the mood to despise the Grudge long before the credits began to roll. However, a comically abrupt ending that tosses in one more scare from out of nowhere and implies the death of Riseborough's protagonist was enough to inspire audience frustration and secure the grudge's place in the pantheon of F Cinema Score movies. Maybe we should tear our eyes out so that we can't see them anymore. Perhaps we all should have recognized that 2020 would be a dark year for movies, since it was a dark year for pretty much everything. January of that infamous year delivered not one, but two separate features that garnered F Cinema Score grades. Exempting the trio of features that scored that grade in 2012, this marked the first year since 2007 when multiple movies were deemed worthy to be given an F grade. The second feature to score this dubious honor in 2020 was yet another horror film, surprise, surprise. The turning stars Mackenzie Davis as a woman who must watch over a pair of kids. These youngsters turned out to be quite troubled souls, and the ancient house they inhabit is equally disturbing. The turning eventually pulls out a bunch of strange twists in its final moments, including a reveal that the big chase scene set piece was all just a vision and an attempt to keep audience members on their toes. Instead, this screenwriting decision just irritated moviegoers and left them unsatisfied. Plus, the decision to go with a PG-13 rating on this horror film ensured it couldn't even deliver lots of gory deaths or memorable kills to give viewers an extra jolt of adrenaline. The turning failed miserably, and it, combined with the grudge, proved an unfortunate harbinger of all the problems that awaited cinematic storytelling in 2020.